Scripture reading for this morning's lesson will be taken from Exodus 32, verses 1 through 4. I'll be reading from the New King James. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And Aaron said to them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, This is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Certainly good to be with you today. Um, well, I'm glad I don't have to wear those masks all the time. <laughs> so uh, actually today's lesson, this morning and this evening, we're going to be looking at a couple Old Testament lessons uh, and actually specifically Moses. So if you're able to come back tonight, tonight will be a, a shorter version just to accommodate, I think, the uh, services there, but uh, I'm going to make, keep it kind of brief tonight, but uh, welcome you to come back for both lessons. Uh, this morning's lesson, though, is, again, a very familiar story to you, and actually something that uh, amazes me uh, when we go through this, and I think you'll find it uh, amazing as well, to see how quickly the children of Israel turned away from God, and, and we're going to notice some lessons from that. That's what the lesson is going to really be about here this morning. So I've entitled the lesson the golden calf. And um, we're going to walk through a little bit of the story here of the Israelites and what they experienced in Egypt and then look at what they did. Um, you know, the Old Testament is full of stories and we don't follow the Old Testament in terms of uh, laws and commandments, but there are lessons there for us. In fact, uh, there's two passages I list here. Romans 15, 4 says, for whatsoever things are written before written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. So there's things we can learn from the old law. And some of those things we learn, hopefully we won't repeat the mistakes of what we see some individuals doing in the old law. And verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 10, it says, now all these things happen to them as an examples. And they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. And so we're going to notice these this lesson here around the golden calf and see what we can learn um, from it. So the, uh, this was uh, Egyptian God called Api, and he was uh, said the most important and highly regarded bull deity of ancient Egypt. And, and so this was uh, quite common for the Egyptians to worship idols. In fact, their account is somewhere around 1,400 different idols that the Egyptians worshipped. So this was quite common practice. In fact, I, I would dare say probably a lot of the craftsmanship around building these idols were probably skills that some of the Israelites had. They, they most likely were the ones who were making these idols and probably developed some pretty skill around the forming of, of these, these idols. Um, he was perhaps the first god of Egypt. And, and the question I really want us to focus on, and we're going to notice this, is how in the world could they possibly turn away from the one true God after what they have seen and experienced? I'm going to, so just for a few minutes, I want you to kind of put yourself in their shoes. And then we're going to see why the, this idea of the golden calf, there's some really valuable lessons for us today. Now, there's a passage in First Peter chapter two talks about a dog returning to its vomit. The idea is is like you're you're in a certain spot, you come into a much glorious spot, and in, in this case, talking about a Christian, and then you go back to those the ways of the world. Um, we forget about those great things that we have, and we turn back to the like a, a sow. Uh, it talks about a pig worrying and uh, going in the mire, and a dog returned to its vomit there in Second Peter two. 20 through 22. And um, so we're going to notice this, this, this story for just a few 
minutes, the time we have this morning. Let's walk through these Egyptian plagues. I thought it was kind of interesting. If you remember the story, the Israelites were in captivity for over 400 years. And God saw his people and wanted to bring them out of Egypt. And he sent Moses to do that. We're going to notice a, a lesson about this even this evening a little bit more. But let's just take a look at these plagues. So the first plague, turning the Nile to blood, was a judgment against Apis, the god of the Nile, Isis, the goddess of the Nile, and Kum, the guardian of the Nile. The Nile was also believed to be the bloodstream of Osiris, who was reborn every year when the river flooded. The river, which formed the basis of daily life in the national economy, was devastated. As millions of fish died in the river and the water was unstable, Pharaoh was told, by this, you will know that I am the Lord, Exodus 7, 17. So we, one thing you may not appreciate about these different plagues, these plagues actually attacked very specific gods of the Egyptians. And it went, and part of the, the lesson here is to show them that the one true God had power over all the gods that these Egyptians were worshiping. And the first one there was when he turned the water into blood. The second plague, bringing frogs from the Nile, was a judgment against Heket. He was the frog-headed goddess of birth. Frogs were thought to be sacred and not to be killed. Did you know that? They weren't supposed to kill these frogs. God had the frogs invade every part of the homes of the Egyptians, and when the frogs died, their stinking bodies were heaped up um, in offensive piles all through the land. That's in, talks about that in Exodus 8, 13, and 14. The third plague, which you can see is lice or gnats, is another word for that, was his judgment on Set, the god of the desert. Unlike the previous plagues, the magicians were unable to duplicate this, and even Pharaoh's own Egyptian said, this is the finger of God. This was not no magic trick. This was nothing that Moses was doing. They said, this is the finger of God. There in Exodus 8 and 19. The fourth plague was flies. This was a judgment on Utichit. He was the fly god. Even that, imagine that, fly god. But they had a god for the fly. In this plague, God clearly distinguished between the Israelites and the Egyptians. So this is the first plague where he didn't just, the other plagues was, was affected everyone, both the Egyptians and the Israelites. This particular plague only affected the Egyptians. Um, the, as no swarms of the flies bothered the areas where the Israelites lived. And again, Exodus 8, 21 through 24. The fifth plague was death of the livestock. And this obviously, this, this comes, rings home here because we're going to talk a little bit about the golden calf was a judgment on the goddess Hathor and the god of Apis, who were both depicted as cattle. As with the previous plague, God protected his people from the plague. While the cattle of the Egyptians died, God was steadily destroying the economy of Egypt while showing his ability to protect and provide for those who obeyed him. So he did not, he did not lay a hand on the Israelites' livestock, but rather protected them. Uh, that's Exodus 9, 7. So to find out if the Israelites were suffering along with the Egyptians, um, uh, uh, Pharaoh sent out investigators and, and they, they recognized, you know what, this has just happened to our livestock. It's not happened to these Israelites' livestock. So that was the first five plagues. So plague number six was boils. This was a judgment against several gods over health and disease. Sekhmet, Sunu, and Isis. This time the Bible says the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils. So even the magicians were affected by this. Clearly the religious leaders were powerless against the God of Israel. The uh, the next plague, we're on, uh, oh yeah, I'm sorry. The last three plagues, Pharaoh was given a special message from God. These plagues would be more severe than the others, and they were designed to convince Pharaoh and all his people that there is none like me in all the earth, Exodus 9 and 14. Pharaoh was even told that he was placed in his position by God, so God could show his power and declare his name through all the earth, Exodus 9 and verse 16. As an example of his grace, God warned Pharaoh to gather whatever cattle and crops remained in the previous plagues and shelter them from the coming storm. Some of Pharaoh's servants heeded the warning there in Exodus 9, 20, while others did not. The seventh plague, hail, attacked Nut, the sky goddess, Osiris, 
the crop of fertility God and set the storm God. This hail was like nothing they'd ever seen before. It was accompanied by a fire which ran around the ground and everything left out in the open was devastated by the hail and the fire. Again, the children of Israel were miraculously protected and no hail damaged anything in their lands. As before God brought the next plague, he told Moses that Israelites would be able to tell their children of the things they had seen God do in Egypt and how he, sh it, he showed them God's power. The eighth plague, locusts, again, focused on Nut, Osiris, and Set. The later crops, wheat and rye, which had survived the hail, were now devoured by swarms of locusts. This literally, there would be no harvest in Egypt. The ninth plague, darkness, was aimed at the sun god, Re, who was symbolized by Pharaoh himself. So this plague actually attacked Pharaoh specifically. For three days, the land of Egypt was smothered with an uncertain, unearthly darkness, but the homes and Israelites miraculously had light. The final plague, the 10th plague, was the death of the firstborn male. It was a judgment on Isis, the protector of children. In this plague, God was teaching the Israelites a deep spiritual lesson that pointed to Christ. Unlike the other plagues, which the Israelites survived by virtue of their identity as God's people, this plague required an act of faith from them. This is the first one they actually had to do something. God commanded each family to take an unblemished male, lamb, and kill it. The blood of the lamb was smeared on the top sides of their doorways, and the lamb was roasted and eaten that night. Any family did not follow God's instructions would suffer the last plague. God described how he would send the destroyer to the land of Egypt with orders to slay the firstborn male in every household, whether human or animal. The only protection was the blood of the lamb over the door. When the destroyer saw the blood, he would pass over in the house and leave it untouched. This is where, obviously, the term Passover comes from. And so God protected them. And I'm, I'm glad you, I normally don't like to read things when I'm preaching a lesson, but I thought it was worth the time. And just imagine experiencing all these things and seeing these plagues. And this is what the Israelites saw. And, and, and go further. So they saw all these plagues and saw God conquer all these Egyptian gods to show that and declare that he was God over all those Egyptian gods. And then he took them through the Red Sea, remember? He took them through the dry land and, and heaved the Red Sea up and they walked across on dry land. They saw all that. They witnessed it all. And yet, what do we find happening? It's amazing to me what people will see and witness and yet what they'll do. So fast forward for our lesson today. So we have Moses. Moses there in, in, in Exodus 32. He went up into the mountain, right? There's a, and, and we're going to, if you read the, the verse here in verse 18, it says, and all the people witnessed the thunderings and lightnings and flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then said Moses, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has not come to test you, and that his fear may be before you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. And so Moses went up into the mountain. And he was there for 40 days and 40 nights. And in this time, we're going to see, even though they had witnessed all those plagues and God's conquering over all these Egyptian gods, they turn away from God. And not only them, but even Aaron, Moses' brother, they quickly forgot how patient God was. They didn't have the patience, as we're going to see here. They didn't have the patience, couldn't wait, couldn't wait for Moses to get back. And so the lesson for us today, and the question is, is why are we lose patience when it comes to Christ, the coming of Christ, and him coming back? In two, 2 Peter 3 and 4, it says, in saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Back in Paul's time there in Galatians 1, 6, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. 
it just really amazes me what they witnessed. And yet they, they turned away. They turned away from God and turned to these Egyptian, the, the Egyptian God. But then I look among ourselves and I see individuals doing things they shouldn't be doing. Even though they know better, it's no different today. You may look at that example and say, how in the world could those Israelites turn away from God? But you know, we see the same thing today. They lost patience. They couldn't wait. There's 40 days for Moses to return. They needed a, a, they needed a new God just in those 40 days. That's not very much time, given how long they were in captivity, 400 years. Couldn't wait 40 days for Moses to return. But I see it around me every day. People are so impatient. So impatient. If you don't believe me, just go to the airport. I actually, I get entertained by watching, watching people become impatient. Because I actually, I'm a pretty patient person. And I, but, you know, when you get that little ticket, it, it tells you group one, group two, depending on what airline you're flying with. I fly so much, I'm always in group one or group three, depends on, on the, uh, whether I get upgraded first class or not. So I always got that number, but you can see people, they literally will just, they're, they're group five, but they're, they're, they got, they're going to be number one in the group five when it's called. And you get in that plane and you put your bags in and you just sit there. You're not going to get there any faster. We're just so impatient. We, we see that constantly. Um, even, even in services, sometimes I think, do we, you know, even when's the preacher going to be done? And you think, and again, we've done lessons on time. We see how short it is, but oh, we just, we got to get out of here because we got so much stuff to do, right? There's so much going on outside. That I just got to get out of here. And when the services are over, man, you see some people are shooting for the door because they got so many things they got to do. We just don't have the patience we need to have. Uh, I admire fishermen. Um, you know, even yesterday I saw some fishermen sitting out there and they set out, or maybe it was, I guess it was Saturday uh, and Friday and Saturday, but they sit there all, they'll sit there all day. And sometimes they won't catch anything. But that, that, that day was a good day. They were catching a lot of fish. And I said, this is why they come every day because they know it may be a day where they catch nothing, but the next, they know if they come the next day or the next day, eventually those fish are going to start biting. We need to be more patient. And if you're losing heart, um, we need to constantly remind ourselves of that we need to serve the one true God. He's not, he's, he's, he's always there for us. But why? Why do we, we not? Why do we give up? Why are we not willing to wait for it? You know, like a child who can't wait for dessert after dinner or candy, tell them can't eat that till after dinner. Patience is something we all need to learn from. And certainly we see um, that from the golden calf. Another lesson we can learn from this is Aaron himself. I mean, it's one thing to see the people turn their heart away from God, but even Aaron, Moses' brother, even Aaron himself, says, and Aaron said to them, break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people broke off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron and he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. And they said, this is, and they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now they knew that wasn't true. Isn't it amazing how people, we, we, we lie to ourselves? We tell ourselves certain things. That wasn't true. That wasn't like, that wasn't the God that brought them out of the land of Egypt. But that's what they said. So when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Everything is great now, right? We got what we wanted. We got the golden calf. But how sad is that? Given what they had seen and witnessed, the miracles they had seen, they turned their back on the Lord. But Aaron just got tired of hearing their complaint. That happens sometimes, right? You ever see a parent give in or a, a teacher give in or um, folks in leadership position just give in because they're just tired and they don't have the energy to fight, to push back anymore. Again, it's no different today. People don't lack, people lack patience. 
and, and we see it, but we cannot give in. And why do we let that pressure get to us? He gave in to the will of the people there, uh, 21 and 25 says, Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you have brought so great a sin upon them? Aaron said, do not let the anger of my Lord become hot. You know the people that they are set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods that shall go before us as for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt. We, will do, we do not know what has become of him. He's going 40 days. What happened to him? Maybe he's, he got killed or, or something. We need to do something ourselves. He said to them, whoever has any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me and I cast it in the fire and this calf came out. I can tell you, I know enough about castings that that's not how it, it works. And I can certainly tell you, God didn't make that golden calf come out of that fire. Now, when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame among their enemies. See, there's a responsibility as leaders. Sometimes you can't give people what they want. Sometimes you can't give your children what you want. But it's not in their best interest. Sometimes we might get mad when folks maybe we're subjected to don't give us what we want. But sometimes that's not what's best for us. And that wasn't what was good for the people. Aaron gave them what they wanted, right? But it wasn't what they needed. And again, in this congregation, I look at the, the elders here. There may be things you want done. Maybe things you want changed. It may not be in the best interest of the congregation. Acts 20 and 28 through 31 says, Therefore, take heed yourselves, speaking to the elders here, and to all the flock, which among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage woods, wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, and draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch, remember that for three years I did not cease to warn them night and day. And so when we look at, fast forward to um, today, elders are watching over the congregation here. They're responsible for the souls of the members. And you know what? You may look at them and say, I think they need to do this, so they need to do that but it may not be what's best. And I can tell you the devil and the world will do whatever they can to try to draw you away or try to pervert the gospel. That's his, that's his mission. That's what he wants. And preachers, as they charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap to themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and will be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of the evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Aaron needed to speak out against the people and identify what they wanted was not right. Preachers need to preach the truth today. And that's not easy. It's sometimes, it, you know, telling people the truth is not what they want to hear. May, making everybody feel good is not the preacher's job. The job is preach the truth. And sometimes we want to avoid the truth because it's not an easy thing to be said. We need to learn from the lesson of Aaron, both elders and preachers, and, and, and be leaders and not give in to the desires always for, of people. You know, it's nice, though, and lucky for Aaron and lucky for the children of Israel. They had Moses. And verse 13 says, Furthermore, the Lord spoke to me saying, I have seen this people, and indeed they are stiff-necked people. Let me alone that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven, and I will make of you a nation mightier and greater than they. Do you know that God could have done that? God could have destroyed those people and gave, uh, created an even greater nation? So I turned and came down from the mountain, Moses speaking here, and the mountain burned with fire, and the two tablets of the covenant were in my two hands. And I looked and beheld you had sinned against the Lord your God. 
had made for yourselves a molded calf. You had turned aside quickly from the way which the Lord had commanded you. Then I took the two tablets, threw them out of my two hands and broke them before your eyes. And I fell down before the Lord as, as, as at the first 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all your sin, which you committed in doing wickedly in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. For I was afraid and of, of the anger and hot displeasure with which the Lord was angry with you to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me at that time also. And the Lord was very angry with Aaron and would have destroyed him. So I prayed for Aaron also at the same time. Lucky for them, they had Moses. God wanted to destroy him. You know, when you sin today and, and maybe you uh, commit things, be thankful that you can have people, righteous people to pray for you. God listens. For every righteous man availed much, right? You know what that means? That means... If somebody's praying for you, and, and it's also an encouragement for us to pray for those that we know that are struggling, because God listens. And lucky for the Israelites, they had Moses plead their case, or else God would have destroyed them all. We need to confess our faults one to another that we may be healed there in James 5, 16. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And how lucky are we today that we have an intercessor, even much greater than Moses. You know, we all sin and come short. Romans 3, 23, all sin and come fall short of the glory of God. We're all going to make mistakes. That goes without saying. And we strive, we talk about striving for perfection in class today. But we need to continue to try to get better. In 1 John 1 and 8, it says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We say that we have not sinned, we have make him a liar, and the word is not in us. And so just that we're going to do some things that don't make sense. We're going to commit some sins, and we're going to fall. But we can't be like the pig, and we can't be like the dog. We've got to get up and resolve not to fall again. And fortunately for us, we have Jesus as our intercessor. Who better to advocate for us? He's, he's an advocate for us. First John 2 and 2 says, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins and not ours only, but also for the whole world. He's our high priest, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was at all, all points tempted as we are yet without sin in Hebrews 4.15. And, and 1 Timothy 2.5 says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. And so how lucky are we that we have Jesus as our mediator? Those Israelites were so fortunate to have Moses. God loved Moses and God listened to Moses. He had sympathy for them because Moses. We have Jesus. Jesus is our cheerleader. He, he wants you to be successful. He's advocating for you. He's mediating for us. But we got to do our part. And so when you go back and look at the, the lesson of, of the golden calf, it just, again, amazing what, what, what they witnessed in the plagues and how God showed he was greater than all those gods of Egypt. And yet, what did they do? They made an Egyptian God and worshiped him. How soon they forget. How soon we forget. We know, we know as, as Christians what we need to be doing. And yet we go, we leave this building and what do we do? We forget who we are. We start acting in a way that's unbecoming of a Christian. That it, it, we become unchristlike. We can't be that way. We can't be forgetful. And we as leaders, even those that are in charge. Moses left Aaron in charge. Aaron was supposed to be the one that was watching the camp while he was gone. And Aaron's like, okay, you guys insist. I'll give you, here you go. I'll, I'll, let's make a golden calf. Here's your golden calf that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And his excuse to, to Moses was, you know, you know these sinful people. That's what's happened in a lot of churches in the world today. They listen to the heart and the will of men. We can't 
we can't be that way. But again, as, as I said, we're so they were lucky to have Moses and we have Jesus. Jesus is fighting for you. He's your advocate and, and he's there to intercede for us. He's our high priest. He's our mediator. And so there's very, very valuable lessons we can learn from the old law. One is that we can repeat the same mistakes. We can be just like them and we can fall just like they, they, they fell and committed sin. But we need to rise up. And perhaps you're in an audience and, and, and are living in the ways of the world. Maybe you never become a Christian. You know, the, the path to salvation is clear. You hear the word, you got to believe in Jesus. You know, God did his part. He sent his son. Jesus shed his blood. He did it. He did his part. You know, just like we talked about, God showed the Israelites that he was more powerful than the gods of Egypt. God has shown us how much he loves us. He's shown you how much he loves you. But you got to do your part. You've got to, hearing the gospel, you got to believe in Jesus. If you believe in him, repent of your sins and say, you know what? I'm going to commit my life to Jesus and be baptized. And then be committed to live faithfully till the end of our lives. You're subject to the Lord's invitation. If we can assist you in any way, please come together while we stand and while we sing. Thank you.